but several years ago we started using more and more landscape fabric. Now this stuff is a netted, what they call geotextile. It's cost $59 for a 300 foot roll, four by 300 foot roll. We burn the holes with a propane torch and we can use this stuff. We pulled this stuff up that was 20 years old off of a vineyard and it was still usable. So we, you, the nice thing about this, if you can put a crew out with a bunch of transplants with this type of stuff that's already got the holes in it and you can make, you'll be sure that all the plants are going in the right spacing. Whereas if you're on black plastic, you're gonna have to have somebody managing where all those holes are made. But at the end of the season, we basically just pull this up, <coughs> shake it off, let it dry off, fold it up, mark it with the length and the hole pattern and store it for next year. Hey Mark? Yes. How many, how long have you guys been doing that with landscape fabric? 15 years. And how often have you had to replace it? We haven't wow. replaced any of it. It's way tough. And you can pull it up with the tractor. For some reason, these, some of these moving slides are not working. Um, I'm not sure if I can make that happen. Uh, these people, if you check out their website, developed a, an adaptation for a mulch layer. Let's see if there's possible that. Nope, not going to work. But anyway, those people developed a... Uh, an adaptation for a plastic, black plastic mulch layer that will both re-roll the old stuff and roll out landscape fabric and lay it just like uh, uh, black plastic. This stuff has been pinned down on top of beds that were prepared. It's been pinned down with landscape staples. We're just putting a little bit of soil over the edges just to keep it from blowing. <coughs> then it'll be ready to plant. So. <clears throat> what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize cultivation. We're trying to hold as much soil moisture in the ground as possible with mulches. Whether they, we started out with all organic mulches and eventually went to partly organic mulches and these fabrics are plastic. Because we simply, as, a, as the plantings got larger and larger and larger, we could not keep up with the weeding on just organic mulches. So we started out using all wheat straw. Actually, we started out using hay and round bales from the neighbors and introduced all sorts of horrible weeds, including Bermuda and Johnson grass and all kinds of stuff. And then uh, we got a little bit smarter, a little bit too late, started using all wheat straw. Wheat straw is also problematic. Um, it's just that an organic mulch uh, can never do quite the same kind of weed control as a fabric can. So we use organic mulches in particular situations. But by transplanting, instead of doing a lot of direct seeding, on this scale, as everything's related to our scale, um, we are able to make sure that we have solid stands of crops. We have a nice propagation facility so we can produce zillions of transplants. Producing transplants is not that time consuming for us. And even trans the act of transplanting isn't, isn't that really that terrible either. We don't have a, a transplanting machine. We don't really need one for what we're doing. But having the weed control through the fabrics after the plants are out is really important. But in this type of situation where we're growing tulips or gladiolas or lilies or garlic or sometimes even potatoes will do this way, we're actually planting these things in furrows uh, that are fertilized in beds that have been prepared and covering them up. And then those are, we put drip tape down and then we put uh, <coughs> mulch on them, let's see. So this bed was planted, covered up, put drip tape down and then mulched with wheat straw. And then the tulips come up through the mulch and we don't have to do any subsequent weeding for the most part. Only if uh, your crops are sensitive to acidity. Generally, you know, if you don't till that type of stuff in, you're okay as a surface mulch. When you till stuff in like that, then you got a problem. Yeah. As a former blueberry field, wouldn't it be a pretty acid pH existing there? <coughs> well, we've amended it since it was blueberries. So on a lot of these beds have gotten lime or wood ash to bring the pH down, bring the pH up, excuse me. Yeah. Once we made the transition into vegetables and flowers, we started amending the soil to, to adjust the pH. And so only when absolutely necessary do we do hand cultivation. And that means the type of things that have to be direct seeded. Now with flowers, 
there aren't that many there. It's a handful of things that have to be direct seeded, like Larkspur. Larkspur is one of the things that really should be direct seeded. Doesn't like transplanting. But uh, with, in the vegetables, of course, you've got all the root crops that have to be direct seeded. And in the summertime on our vegetables, we can't use mulches in the late summer because of insects. Insects hide under all the mulches, including the uh, landscape fabric. And so we end up planting on bare beds and keeping them uh, cultivated. A scuffle hoe? A stirrup hoe? A hula hoe? It's U shaped like this. It's sharp on both sides. They're pretty handy. But the idea is to get the weeds when they're real tiny and not to go too deep and bring up more weeds. The type of soil building we're doing up here is uh, we're, we're adding manures, of course, uh, chicken litter most of the time, compost, but in the wintertime we're building soil with cover crops. And we use our spader to till down crops that have been planted in the fall or buckwheat that's been planted in the summer. Yes? Do you flail mow before you spade? We are now, but for our, when I took these pictures we didn't have the flail mower. Um, even if you only have a walk behind tiller, you can till in buckwheat. This is a lot easier way to do it. <laughs> and now we're using this, actually. We actually bought a flail mower for the BCS, and we use that for taking down crop residues in the, in the fall. Of course, it's just a small version of a regular tractor flail mower. Um, but it, it pulverizes everything and leaves it in place. It can be tilled in. I, I'm actually doing that over the top of fabric. So I've got that set to where it's not going to pick up the fabric. I can till that down and then we can tip pull that fabric off. Pretty handy. They, they're a little pricey and they're quite heavy. I hurt one of my shoulders using it. But this is how we used to do it before we had the flail mower. We'd do it with a brush hog. And of course that's, uh, that just cuts everything up into coarse pieces and throws it to the side. It doesn't do anything like a flail mower does. Okay, on to the flowers. I just wanted to give you a sort of background of what we're how we're doing it. I'm going to take you through the cut flower production year um, in the order that we have them in the springtime. So anemones I think is something that would be great down here. It's a Mediterranean cut flower. Um, we have friends in Austin who have 40 acres of cut flowers, Pam and Frank Karnowski, and they grow a lot of these in hoop houses. Um, they take really cold weather and they're fantastic for vase life. They can last up to 10 days. They come in these saturated colors that people love. They start blooming for us in mid-February. I think they would start blooming a little bit earlier down here. And their cycle is that they go dormant in the summer. If they're from the Mediterranean, so they get rain in the wintertime and it gets hot and dry in the summer and that's their dormancy period. So when you buy them in the fall, and you have to start thinking about buying them early. So it's the best time to order them is in May and June, July. Don't wait past August to, to even buy them, the corms. They'll send you the corms in September or October. And they're just dried up little pea things about this size. They cost about 30 cents a piece. And you have to soak those in running water overnight and then put them in soil media in plastic bags and put them in the refrigerator for about three weeks to break their dormancy. And once they start to form little roots, then we put them in the greenhouse in 50 cell trays and grow them out to plants and then set them out. But for us, we, have, we can have zero degree temperatures the same way, the same day that we plant out these. Of course, we try not to plant on a zero degree day. But we can have really cold temperatures, and these plants can take it. Now, this was probably taken in March. When we're first start, we're, we start our farmer's market in uh, uh, early April for the main market. We have a market all winter, but our main market starts in April. And so it's nice to have something hit the ground running. They come in all these colors, and they're perfect for mixing with daffodils. Yeah? What's the base life for a cut anemone? Ten days. We found that you know a lot of our flowers we like to, especially like daffodils, you can see these daffodils here that have been cut um, and they're hardly open. They're still mostly closed. The anemones, uh, we've tried cutting that way and they don't tend to open up enough before market. 
That's cool. So if we cut them in the bud and we put them in the cooler, we take them to market two days later, they're not open at market and the public can't really see how pretty they are. So actually it's better for us to wait until they've been open one day in the hoop house and cut them then. The only insect problem we've had with them has been aphids, the aphids like anemones, and you have to be careful about what you use for, for aphid control. Safer soap will burn anemones, we found out the hard way. It discolors the blossoms. So we use a neem product or pyganic. A neem product like Nemagard is a good way to control anemones. But you have to be really careful of monitoring aphids on anemone production. You know, you can carry over aphids on overwintering brassica hoop houses, so you have to be kind of aware of what your population, they can explode pretty fast. <laughs> but like I said, we have big banks of daffodils that were, you know, over the years, we've been accumulating massive amounts of daffodils, but people get tired of coming to market and just having yellow, and these are fantastic to mix. Uh, they're very eye-catching, the color. This is what they look like in the hoop house. They're ferny. They're basically a woodland plant. They're a low-growing woodland plant. Um, our favorite colors are the reds, the blues, and that, there's a, that one is called Marone Bordeaux on the left, that purple color. Here we are in the hoop house. What does that say? Mid-March. And they're just coming on strong. Kale by that time is starting to really bush out. So what it looks does like heat do to them? Heat? If you get a warm spell in the middle of the winter. They don't shut down until mid-May for us. I mean, a warm spell in the winter is going to make them just grow faster, but a warm spell in the winter isn't going to mean 60 degree nights generally and 95 in the daytime. So. Um, for us, a warm spell is 55 <laughs> with 35 at night, you know. This is uh, after they've been refrigerated for three weeks. Anemones need to be refrigerated three weeks at about 39 degrees. So we just put them in our refrigerator at home after they've been soaked. And once they've, they're all plumped up and they've been then refrigerated for three weeks, you plant them in 50-cell trays. You probably could plant them directly in the ground, but we like to plant them in the greenhouse and monitor them, get them to being nice plants before we transplant them. But they are high value. The florists uh, will pay 50 cents to a dollar a piece for them. At market, we can get a dollar a piece for them. We tend to bundle them up in uh, bunches of 10 with rubber bands, keep the stems from twirling around in the, in the refrigerator. That's Galilee Blue. A lot of these are, are produced in the Middle East, and they have names like Galilee. Some of the Israeli uh, strains are some of the best. Bordeaux. The florist really wants these. So when they start blooming early, before our markets get started good, we'll be able to sell these to the florist, no problem. The more good vegetative growth you get on the plants before they start blooming, the longer the stems are going to be. See, these are all bundled in, in tens with rubber bands. And then there's another flower called ranunculus, which is related to anemones. It can be handled exactly the same way. And these are awesome, also awesome cut flowers, have exactly the same type of bloom dormancy. And you also buy them from the same suppliers. We get all these from Glockner, and that uh, is in the resources at the last slide here. Propagated the same way, they take, you have to refrigerate them at about 55 degrees instead of 39 for three weeks, and they'll start to sprout. Then we plant them in those 50-cell trays, transplant them out. These were planted in mid-December. This was just taken like a, uh, last week, this picture. That's what they look like now. But you can see we have these row covers handy to keep them covered up during the coldest weather. The flowers that you showed a while ago that you're bundling in tin. Yeah. Do you only sell them in bundles of tin? No, no. Those, are, those have been prepared probably for our florist order. <clears throat> and what kind of discount do you have to uh, offer for wholesale, for like to a florist? The best thing to do if you're going to deal with a florist is to have somebody that will give you their, um, their buyer's chart from a, from a supplier to see what they're already paying for them. And make sure that when they, when they give you that information that they also let you know what they're having to pay for transportation charges. Because the, 
the wholesale suppliers from California that mo a lot of florists are buying from, they'll list a price for you, and then you've got transportation on top of that, which is often at least the same amount as the cost. So you want to find out what are you competing with. For some things, like anemones, you can compete and get good prices. Uh, but on other things like lilies, you can't compete because the, or gladiolas, you can't compete with the commercial price. The florist isn't going to want to buy from you unless they're one of those enlightened florists that knows that you have better quality, better vase life, and you have a different offering. But that's, that's really the only way to know what to charge is to get a hold of the types of, of charts they're looking at when they're buying. And that means you've got to have a friend in the florist, <laughs> free to florist. And those, those flowers there don't ship very well either. Not really. Not really. They, they, it's amazing how well they've got this stuff packaged these days. You can get everything. Yes, sir? Do you have a separate branch of management for your flower production um, compared to vegetable production, or it just all goes together? <laughs> we do everything. Yeah. Well, no, However, I mean, a lot of, on a lot of farms, you'll find somebody that's taking care of the flower production and somebody that's taking care of the vegetables just through natural you know, attraction. And especially because a lot of times we don't just sell straight bunches of flowers. We do arrangements and we do weddings. And so you have to have people that are attracted to doing that type of thing. Some vegetable growers, they don't want, they don't want to think about any of that. You know, so they have their wife do it or have one of their employees do it. Yeah. But uh, we like all of it. So, um, and these things share our vegetable cooler. You'll read a lot of things about uh, not having your flowers in the same cooler with your vegetables. And we do because we don't have any choice. These are ranunculus. This same thing I took a picture of last week in the hoop house. This is what it's going to look like in April. And those are showstoppers at the market. People love these. Ranunculus. Is that you, you the back open? Yeah. And part of this is because of our market. Most of our market is retail. Directly to the consumer. Their impulse buys at the farmer's market. Yeah. And that's why you want to create something that can't resist. A lot of times it has to be a little bit more open than something that's going to go in a wholesale cooler. So those, those, those two things started blooming for us in late February, early March. And so we'll often have to go to the florist with them before our main market starts. By the time, daffodils, I don't know about, you all grow daffodils down here? Good. Um, they're inexpensive, but we've had to... Um, focus on late blooming daffodils. So if we get a warm period, we'll have daffodils all come on in mid-March before our main farmer's market comes on. So we've focused on late blooming. These, uh, these tend to bloom about the last week of March. The nice thing about daffodils is if you'll catch them real early, you can keep them in the cooler for 10 days to two weeks in the high 30s and they'll be fine. Daffodils are something that you don't want to wait this long to catch them. Um, daffodils are something that you don't want to put with other flowers. They have something toxic in, the, in their juice, flower juice, so you don't store them with other flowers in the same bucket. Also, we don't cut them. They're pulled. So you, you reach down to the bottom of the stem and you pull on it slightly and it'll pop, and that gives you the longest stem. Because stem length equals value in the cut flower world. These were uh, actually blueberry, new blueberry plantings that we ended up stuffing with daffodils all around the bases of the blueberries. It, now the blueberries aren't there anymore, <laughs> and we, it turned out not to be a great idea. I don't think it really affected the blueberry growth too much, but it, um, it was difficult having to wait for all this stuff to, to, to die and go dormant before we could ever do any weed cleanup. So uh, we actually have moved, this last summer we moved all those daffodils, but all those daffodils, those three rows that are over 200 feet long and four feet wide, came from one 40 foot long bed that had been in about six years and we lifted it and then peppered this area and all those daffodils came out of it. So you don't have to start with a lot. They multiply and eventually, really for best bloom, they need to be lifted about every fifth year or so. 
So we basically undercut these rows this, this summer and when they were dormant and, and lifted them all and then replanted them elsewhere.